Come on, just give Jesus another round of applause in this place. The battle, the battle belongs to him. Amen. We did this one a couple of weeks back. I don't know if you still remember it, family. Is he worthy there on top? Come on, brothers. Can we have it on the screen so the family can sing it with us? Amen. So we're going to sing together. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's worship Jesus together. Is all creation grown in yes. truly love us he does. does the spirit move among us he does. and does Jesus our Messiah forever all as he loves he does. Does. does our God intend to dwell in us again Somebody say, He died. Is anyone worthy? Come on, say, Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is dead. To ransom the slave. Say, every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us the kingdom and priest to God to reign with the soul. Somebody say, is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessings and honor and glory? Is he worthy? 
Is he worthy? Come on, somebody. Is he worthy? Say, he. that one again. Amen. Come on. Come on, let's glorify the Lord of Lords. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deeper? We do. You know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through. Come on, say we do, but we wish that we could make it all brand new. We do. Come on, sing with us, family. Say, is all creation groaning? Can I just hear the church at this point? Is the new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Good that we remind ourselves of this. It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root of the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Somebody glorify Jesus in this place. Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? Does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Are you ready? Are you ready, Impact? Say, is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah. Who conquered the grave? He is David, the of the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. So every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us the kingdom and priest of God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy?
That is the biggest question. Is he worthy? Come on, somebody testify. Say he.
thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Father. Oh, we bless your name. You are worthy, Lord. There is none like you, Lord. Oh, no one else can touch our hearts like you do, Lord. Hallelujah. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Hallelujah. I just want to give a moment as we are in God's presence. Just to, I just want to give a moment for us just to wait on the Lord. Just for a few minutes. Let's just wait upon the Lord. Father, we thank you that you are here with us this morning. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless your people. We ask for your manifest presence among your people this morning. Lord, may we get to know you better through your preached word. Lord, come and change us. Come and challenge us. Come and edify us. Come and do your will in this meeting this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. let's put our hands together for the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. Amen? Amen. All the time he is good. Uh, before we start, uh, I, before I go into the sermon, I want to welcome a very special uh, mother and father in our midst. Would you please just stand, Dr. Tux, Auntie Nancy. Let's just welcome them. <laughs> it is good to have you with us. They always watch online, and, um, and so, because they've been living in Kenya for a, for, for a while, and then they went back to Zim, and now they are with us. So we are happy to be with you, and we are glad that you are still healthy, and we can see God is keeping you, and we pray that he continues to do that. It's so good to have you with us this morning. Now, last week, we, we, we spoke on three facts that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Again, you can go to our website, go to our our podcast place, and then you can go and listen through that sermon. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit this month, building up to Pentecost on the, on the 23rd, and then also the last Sunday of, 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 of the month of May. So we spoke on three facts Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, which was uh, the helper comes from the Father was the first one. The helper testifies about Jesus was the second one, because Jesus said he's sending the helper in his place because he needs to go away. And that our testimony, the final point was that our testimony should align with the testimony about Jesus. So when we testify about him, we testify alongside the Holy Spirit about who Jesus is. Because we cannot do some, something that the Holy Spirit is not doing. All right? So that was last week's sermon. And then that laid the foundation for where we are going in terms of preaching this month. So today we will look at the task of the Holy Spirit. There's some specific things the Holy Spirit does which Jesus mentions. And we will look at three tasks of the Holy Spirit. Now, throughout the Bible, we see a lot of tasks being done by the Holy Spirit, but today we will look at three specific ones. He said he, he does that once we understand um, that we will be able to, so when we understand these tasks, we will be able to align ourselves better with the work of the Holy Spirit. So when I go into and minister to someone, whether it is on a pulpit or whether it is, it is in a shop or whether it is at work, I can align myself with what the Holy Spirit is doing. And that's what we are going to look at this morning, at these three specific tasks. And, and so when, when we understand that, we will be able to understand better His work, and we'll be able to, to join Him in His work. Now, these three tasks should be the framework in which we minister to. 
when we go out and make disciples, when we go out and pray for someone, when we go out and encourage people, whether it is at work, whether it is at home, whether it is um, on street evangelism, door to door, this is, creates a nice framework for which we minister under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So whether you believe it or not, God's presence and God's power is on you already the day you accepted him as your Lord and Savior. So there's, so, so, so after that you get baptized in the Holy Spirit and now you're ready for ministry. So we are working towards it. But because his presence is already there, his power is there. And because you are saved, you are now a son and daughter of God. He walks with you wherever he goes. Because remember, he promised that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And many times we go through situations where it feels like he is not with me. But remember, we don't serve God based on what we feel. We serve God based on what we know. Even though I don't feel him here, I know. <laughs> Even though I don't see him here, I know. Are you with me? And so, and so, once we understand what the Holy Spirit does, we as Christians should align ourselves with this work, which will make us in tune with the Holy Spirit, His work, and His power. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go into it. Please open your Bibles. If you have your physical Bibles here, yeah, I see we still have some old school people here. There's no problem. There's no judgment on our side. <laughs> you can open your physical Bibles. Those, those of you who have your phones here, please open it. John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. Um, John is in the New Testament. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. Um, John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. All right, this is Jesus speaking here. Remember, as I said last week, Jesus is on his way to be crucified. He's, he's sitting with the last meal with his um, family, uh, with his disciples. And, well, it is his family. And um, he's giving them some final teachings that they need to remember before he leaves. All right, um, before he goes. And amongst other things, he speaks quite a lot about the Holy Spirit. So let's read together. Jesus says the following to his disciples. And when he has come... He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. May God bless his words. We're only going to look at those few verses this morning. There's so much we can learn from there, and I had to take quite a lot away just to streamline the sermon so that we, I don't keep you here the whole day. Now, there's three, three, four things, three things that Jesus mentions in this passage of the task of the Holy Spirit, where he says, and when he has come, when the Holy Spirit, or in this context, he talks about the helper, so when the helper has come, he will convict the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. And he goes on to explain why of sin, why of righteousness and judgment. But the first task of the Holy Spirit, which I want to bring to you, is number one, he will, the Holy Spirit, convict the world. So we want to focus on there. He will. So that's task number one. He will convict the world. Now, the ancient Greek word translated convict as a broader range of meaning than simply the word convict as we know it, especially as it is understood in a legal sense. So, so when we talk about a convict, we talk about someone who broke the law. Now he's convicted by the judge. Um, but the word convict in Greek also um, carries the idea to expose, to refute, and to convince. So the Holy Spirit will convict the word in, in the world. In other words, he will come and expose, he will come and refute, and he will come and convince. Now remember those three words. He will expose, he will refute, and he will convince the world. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in the world and in the individual hearts. To convince and convict of this truth, of the truth. Remember Jesus says, and the helper will lead you into all truth. What did we say? Who is the truth? The truth is a person which is Jesus Christ. All right, so here the Holy, the, here Jesus says He will lead you, and the truth is in Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to read to you a story of what happened about 150 years ago in my hometown in Worcester, where I grew up, 
And the story is exactly about when conviction hit the town. It was a time where, where conviction hit the town so hard that people got saved without anyone preaching to them. <laughs> Let me read to you the story. In 1860, revival also broke out in Wooster, in the congregation where Dr. Andrew Murray and Jan de Vries worked. Now, this is out of the history book, so they call a spade a spade here. One evening, 60 young people gathered for prayer and worship. They were led in devotions by Jan de Vries. They would normally stand up and ask that a specific hymn be sung, or someone would commence with prayer. During one of these prayer meetings, a 15-year-old colored girl got up and simply said, Oh, how I love Jesus. And asked for a song to be sung. All the people present suddenly heard a sound like a distant rumbling. This is what happened in the history books, what's been recorded. It came closer and closer and the building started to shake. Everybody started praying simultaneously. God's presence filled the place. Each one was so burdened by his or her own sin, that they continued to call upon God for forgiveness and pleaded with him that he would cleanse them. Everyone continued praying simultaneously. Does that sound familiar? Where in the Bible do we see examples of this? Of a conviction coming over people. If we Google, if you only Google revivals that happened in, 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 in the olden times, you will see that there was a conviction after long periods of prayer. There was a conviction that the Holy Spirit poured out on people's hearts. And that people in towns, bars closed down. They said, I read a few other uh, revivals, convictions that happened. They said prisons had to close down because there were no one breaking the law anymore. Bars had to close down. Brothels closed down. All these places started closing, closing down. And it wasn't Christians going around and saying, you must shut this place down and, 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 and toy toying in front of this place. It was the conviction of the Holy Spirit that caused these people to come to Christ. Because there was a nation, there was a people that seek God in prayer. The only way we get God to move wherever we want Him to move is to start praying together as a church and say, God, we refuse for Madran to stay in sin like this. God, we refuse for crime to take hold of our country like this. God, we refuse for our government to be like this. We ask for a conviction for you because only you can change people's hearts. That's what happened. This happens when we've seen God's beauty, His purity, His holiness, when we recognize that sin cannot dwell with Him. When Isaiah stood in the presence of God, he was immediately overwhelmed by his own sinfulness. Isaiah said, woe is me. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah was stunned. When he was in the presence of God, to be convicted is to experience an utter dreadfulness of our own sinful nature, even when we are in Christ. Our attitude towards sin becomes that of Joseph who fled temptation when he was crying out, how could I do this evil uh, evil sin against this great God? We are convicted when we become mindful of how much our sin dishonors God. Of how much our wrongdoing dishonors God. Even our thoughts dishonors God. When David was convicted by the Holy Spirit, he cried out, Against you and only you I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David saw his sin primarily as an an affront, as an offense to this holy God. This is what happens when the Spirit of God convicts the world. This is what happens when revival takes place in a community. There there are some places in Ireland and and, and overseas in the European countries where the revival came from before it came to Africa here on our continent, where where after the world wars and these kind of things, a lot of the drinking water were polluted and people couldn't plant, people couldn't drink it, people couldn't do all these things. And what happened was when revival broke out, God started restoring the soil. God started healing the waters. All, about, all through God's spirit, there's the supernatural movement of God happening because there was a nation, there was a people that prayed together and said, God, you need to step in and intervene. There was a movement of God 
people realized their sin and it crossed over. Some story says that, that even before, as people were walking past the church, even before stepping into the church, people fell on their knees and cried out to God because they were convicted of their sin. That's how powerful the Spirit of God moved amongst people. They didn't even hear a sermon. They haven't even heard the song yet. The church service haven't even started beginning yet. And people were on their knees crying out for mercy because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. This is what happened when the Spirit of God moves the world. The musician can't be musicians. The ushers can't be ushers. The deacons can't be deacons. He comes in and he wrecks the place. He takes over completely. How we desire as a church for God's spirit to be poured out on us. Whether we are meeting together here or whether we are meeting together at home. But every time the church gathers to meet, there should be a movement of God's spirit upon his people. A conviction where when sinners come in here and they would walk out of here repented of their sin. Because God has convicted them of what they did wrong. Hallelujah. Amen. But what, what will the Holy Spirit convict the world of? And this brings me to the second task of the Holy Spirit. So the first task was, number one, he convicts the world. The second task, Jesus continues to reflect on this. He says, he will convict the world of sin because they do not believe in Jesus. It is unbelief. The rejection of Jesus, which ultimately proves one to be guilty. The Holy Spirit will tell the world of the importance of trusting in and relying on and clinging, clinging to Jesus to avoid sin. Jesus can help you conquer that sin that you are struggling with. Only through our faith in Jesus Christ, we can be victorious over that sin that you are struggling with. But the essence of the sin Jesus is speaking about here is unbelief. Which is not simply a casual in, incredulity, incredulity, nor a different of opinion. Rather, it is a total rejection of God's message and God's messenger. It's completely rejecting Him. The basic sin is the sin which puts self at the center of things and consequently refused to believe in Him. That is the sin that Jesus talks about here of what he came to convict the world. When the Holy Spirit convicts people of their sin, he represents the righteous judgment of God. There is no appeal of this verdict. The Holy Spirit not only convicts people of their sin, but he also brings them to repentance. Repentance is when you stop doing what you used to do, especially when it comes to sin. You've turned away, uh, you made a 180 degree turn and you walk away, you turn your back on that sin. The Holy Spirit brings to light our relationship with God. So when he, when he brings, convicts people of righteousness, of sin, he, he brings to light the condition of our relationship with God. Because whether you want to agree with me or not, a lot of us are in a position, we do all the right things. And we worship God and we shout at the right times in church and everything. But there's sin in our life that we need to repent of. But we refuse to get rid of that sin because it became a crutch. It became a coping, a coping mechanism for me to go through life but God is calling you out this morning that it is time to walk away from that sin time to repent from that and let Jesus become your strength where that sin was once your strength that's what God is saying to us we are convicted because we become intensely aware of the wrath it exposes to our souls. When the Philippian jailer fell at the apostles' feet and cried, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We all know that story very well. The Holy Spirit brought it to light. He was under conviction. He was certain that without a Savior, he would die. If we don't desire our Savior, how do we expect a world which we disciple, which we evangelize to, to also have a desire of our Savior. If we don't seek God, 
every day and walk closer and closer to Him by repenting of things that, oh, that, be, uh, that brings a wall between us and our relationship. How do I expect someone I'm talking to Jesus about to have a desire to walk close to Jesus and repent? Because we don't even repent. God is calling His people out as a holy priesthood. Holy meaning being set apart for a specific purpose. And our specific purpose is to glorify God, to get to know Jesus Christ and teach others to do the same. But if my getting to know Jesus Christ only ends in the church and I don't ever walk with Him from, from Monday to Saturday, how could I expect the world to change? How do I expect my world to change? Because I have no desire to get to know Him better. We praise the Lord for the conviction of sin. Without it, there would be no salvation. Remember when you came to Christ? Remember that day when you said, now I'm going to be a follower of Jesus? Something in your spirit happened. You had an encounter and a conviction fell upon you. No one told you that this and this and this that you are doing is wrong. You decided it by yourself, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you repented of that because you know people have been arguing with you that you should come to Christ. People have been debating with you that what you do is wrong. And you know the thing about us people is, as human beings, we've got an, an, a qualified advocate inside of us. We can justify each and every sin and say it is right. And, and we get those qualified advocates that they even can quote scriptures. Why am I wrong is right. <laughs> We are good advocates. And we do that. But then the Holy Spirit stepped in. And whether you become, came to salvation in your room, whether you went out into an altar call when an altar call was made, the Holy Spirit stepped in and He changed your life around because there was a conviction that fell on you. Come on. And your heart changed and turned to Jesus. Imagine if we live in this conviction constantly. Wherever we go, the presence of God walks with us. And whoever we come into contact with will fall under this conviction that moves with us. How we will change the world around us. <laughs> How more and more people would come to Christ just because we live under a constant conviction of the Holy Spirit, of who Jesus is. The way I do business, the bus people I do business with, whether they are believers or not, will fall under the conviction of the Holy Spirit when they get to deal with me. Yeah. They will repent. And whatever plans, deceivious plans they had, would be null and void because the conviction of the Holy Spirit would have touched them. We haven't even started preaching yet. We haven't even said a word. It's just the presence, the conviction of the Holy Spirit that walks with us. Jesus is beautiful, isn't he? <laughs> he is so beautiful. Oh, we love him so much. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Father, thank you, Lord, that you are God, that you are a Lord that brings conviction to your people. Oh, Lord, may, may, may this conviction never, never run away. May we never get rid of this conviction, but may we live under this conviction that you are God and we should constantly look to you to help us repent of our sins in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The second task of the Holy Spirit is this. So, so the Holy Spirit will convict the world. He will convict the world of sin. Sorry, I was, I was done with that one. Now, the third task is to con Victor world of righteousness because Jesus is with the Father. To convict the world of righteousness because Jesus is with the Father. Now, the ascension of Jesus, a few weeks ago, we celebrated Ascension Day. <clears throat> and the ascension of Jesus to heaven demonstrated that he had perfectly fulfilled the Father's will. And he had proven himself righteous and exposed the lack of righteousness in a world that rejected him. Because the world were not righteous, they rejected 
Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit only shows the world the righteousness of Jesus and its own unrighteousness. That's why people get angry at you when you preach to them. They would almost say, ah, 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 man, don't, don't come and talk those things about me. I have family members like that. <laughs> yeah, you, you want to come and preach here now? And why? No, I just want to hear where are you going when you are leaving here? Help, help me understand. No, I don't want to talk to me. And you see some of them, when you walk into the room, they run away. They greet, but they are at the door. Yes, nice to see you. I have to go. Because of their righteous, because they know that they are unrighteous. But for some other reason, they don't want to heed and become righteous because they love their sinful nature too much. Many people today um, take the righteousness of Jesus as, as a given. Yet during his life, Jesus was re reviled as an imposter, as a demon possessed, as a wicked destroyer of the law, as a judge, a glutton, as a drunk, and as an illegitimate. The Holy Spirit persuades the work of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, carry on. I'm going, this is going to make more sense as we go along. Whereas righteousness had previously been defined by precepts, meaning this is the standard, this is what the law says, what is righteousness. It has now been revealed in the incarnate Son, in Jesus Christ, who perfectly um, ex gave us an example of what the righteousness should be like. Jesus set the standard of what righteousness should look like. He set the standard. No one else. So because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, my desire should be to be as righteous, to walk in righteousness as Jesus walked in righteousness. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit down. To help you and guide you in all of the truth. In all of righteousness. Because now you've got the standard. And now it's something to strive towards. And that's why I'm saying we, 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 we are a holy people. There is a righteous standard we are all held to. Despite the word stubborn denial that Jesus is the absolute truth. Jesus points to himself. As the standard, listen to what he says. He says, because I go to, a fa to the Father, I will send you the helper. He says, I'm not here anymore to show you the example of what it is to be righteousness. But I'm sending someone else who will help you and convict you of righteousness in me. And that I am the standard of righteousness. There's only one person who came down from heaven, lived the life of sinless perfection, and was sent back to heaven. It is Jesus, the Son of God. The righteousness that the world tries to deny is found and demonstrated in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. Everything he ever said and did was the, was the consummate expression of God the Father. He is a righteousness personified and none can measure up to him. But we strive to be like him. Not be him. We strive to be as righteous as him. With the strength of the Holy Spirit, with the power and the boldness of the Holy Spirit, we walk and walk under the conviction of righteousness which comes from the Holy Spirit. And we try and we try and we try to be like him. Because one day, We'll be made perfect when we are in heaven with our Father. That's who our Jesus is. Now, the fourth and last task of the Holy Spirit is this. To convict the world of judgment. Because the ruler of this world is judged. To convict the world of judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. The judgment of Satan himself means that there will be a final reckoning between God and this rebellious creature, Satan. The Holy Spirit warns the world of the coming judgment. Whether you want to believe in Christ or not, whether you are a good person or a bad person, judgment is coming. Where will you be? 
for us as born again believers, when judgment comes, we have an advocate that has been interceding for us. So when the accuser of the brethren, Satan, comes and he said, this one did that, this and that one did that, and that one did that, and then Jesus would come and stand in front of us and said, but my blood, yeah. I have died. <laughs> Father, forgive them because I've taken their wrath, the wrath that they should get, I've taken it upon me. That's what Jesus did do, to do with us. That's what we have. We've got an advocate interceding for us. So we don't even have to be our own advocate. Come on. We have got one yes. interceding for us, standing between us and the Father. Normally conviction is followed by judgment. But when the Holy Spirit works, there is an in-between step. The, revela the revelation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which can satisfy the judgment for the convicted person. Because he took God's wrath upon himself. The world, the prince of it, is judged. To adhere to it rather than to Christ is to cling to a doomed cause or a sinking ship. Let's not hold on to this world. It is a sinking ship. Let's hold on to this righteousness. Let's hold on to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. The world is facing judgment. No matter how countries try to change the, the climate change policies so that the earth don't get warmer, it's going to burn. We can, we can prolong it. It's like sometimes with death. We, we go for operations and we see science and all these things to prolong our life here on earth. But your time is your time. You must be ready to meet the maker any day. In fact, the judgment, this judgment, the Bible says, has already begun. Jesus identifies Satan as the one whom judgment fell on. He quotes, he says, because the ruler of this world is cast out. He's cast out of heaven. There's no way he can go back. The judgment has already begun. Jesus had earlier indicated that his death on the cross was when the prince of the world will be driven out. He died. He rose again. He, 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 he broke the, the grip that sin has upon our lives. And now when we are in Christ, Satan is judged. So even when I rebuke Satan, or when I pray against Satan, I remind him that he is judged. He has no power here. His powers has been stripped away. He makes us think. That is in control. He makes us think. All he can do is he, he can just talk nice sweet things in our ear and we adhere to that and that causes us to sin. But he has no power to grab us and say I'm going to make you do this unless he possesses us. Now Christ's children are free from that. Christ's children are made loose from being slaves from Satan because we are now in Christ and in his righteousness with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit protects us covers us because where God's spirit is there's no place for a demonic spirit to reign because where there's light light brings light where there was darkness once before and when I walk in the light there will be no darkness in my life because it drives out the darkness but when I have darkness in my life I allow the devil even while I'm in Christ Meaning when I have sin in my life, darkness, I allow the devil to have a grip on my life. Do you see how important it is to repent? <laughs> because as long as you keep that sin, the devil has a hold on you. You can come to church and say, wow, what a worship experience. You go home, you sin, the devil's got you just like this. But once that is brought into the light, he loses his power. Because his power is in darkness, not in the light. So for me as a born again believer, I need to walk in the light as much as possible. I need to walk in Christ as much as possible. So that the more of Christ I have in my life, the more it illuminates the dark areas in my life. And the, the less the devil will have a grip on me. Are you with me? <laughs> the world is facing judgment. It was on the cross that Jesus redeemed sinners for God and utterly vanquished the power of Satan. That by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, which is the devil. 
Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, showing to all the world that Satan's rule has been overthrown. Death, where is your sting? He came there. And as death wears your sting, we are now victorious. So in Jesus, we can never die. We continue to live forever and ever until eternity. And eternity never ends. And that's what Jesus gave us. That's part of the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. Our life on earth will come to an end here. But our life in Christ continues where Christ is. His rule has been overthrown. All who reject Christ and remain in their sin will be condemned along with Satan. And this is the warning that the Holy Spirit sounds in the hearts of the unsaved. And constantly need to repent. They need to repent. And this is the warning that the Holy Spirit gives. The influence of the Holy Spirit in an unsaved person's life will lead that person to a realization that he or she is guilty. That God is just and that all sinners are deserving of judgment and punishment. All of us deserve death. But then Christ stepped in. And now we are in life. Once a sinner has been awakened to his soul's great need, the Spirit will point him to Christ. Remember I said last week, Christ, the Holy Spirit, he reveals Jesus. He points to Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. There's no other way. If that Spirit glorifies the person, whether the person ministering or whatever, then I doubt whether this is the Spirit of God. So this Spirit will point to Christ, the only uh, Savior and refuge from judgment. In all of this, the Spirit uses His sword, the Word of God, and the result is a regenerated heart. In other words, a change of heart. If there's something that you struggle with in terms of sin in your life, born again believer, my prayer for you would be, say, Lord, when you go to your room, change my heart when it comes to this sin. Change my heart, regenerate my heart in terms of the sin because I don't want to do this anymore. It is, an, it, is, it is an offense to you and I don't want to offend you anymore. Change my heart and you don't leave God alone until he has changed your heart. You seek his face, you run after him, you study his word, you, you pursue him like it's an obsession until your heart is changed. Don't let go of God. He needs to and he can change your heart. Seek him. Because it is important that we repent of the things that hold us. Faith comes from hearing the message and the message heard through the word about Jesus Christ. I want to conclude. I want to end of this message and say the following. In the, in the introduction of this message, I said that today we will look at the tasks of the Holy Spirit. And we looked specifically at three tasks, which was the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the sin, uh, the conviction of sin, the conviction of righteousness, and the conviction of judgment. I want to leave you with the following challenge. Born again believer, blood washed believer, saint of God, child of the most high God. I'm talking to you this morning. The next time you minister under the power of the Holy Spirit, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, under the movement and under the unction of the Holy Spirit, the next time you minister in that area, whether it is at your workplace, whether it is at your business, whether it is at your school, where, remember we are ministers. We don't stop ministering. And that's why I mention all these places. Wherever I walk, I minister. Because God's Spirit walks with me. So there's always a need that God's Spirit puts on your heart and you flow with that. And so whether it is encouraging a colleague, whether it is encouraging someone at school or at university or the way we do things, whether it is at church, whenever you minister under the power and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, these three characteristics need to be evident in your ministry then you know that the spirit is there number one the holy spirit's conviction when you minister number two the holy spirit's conviction of sin 
when you minister to that person on you. The Spirit's conviction of righteousness because he points people to Christ saying he's the standard of righteousness. And finally, the Spirit's conviction of judgment that the prince of this world has already been judged and that the devil does not have a hold on people anymore. Come on. If this is not evident when you minister, my question to you would be then, are you really ministering in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you so, so much. Lord, this is your word. And if we measure our own lives up against your word and use your word as a plumb line in our lives, we see that we are missing the goal tremendously of what we thought the ministering of the Holy Spirit is. Jesus, we ask this morning that you would come and align us, that you would convict us of this desire to be aligned, to align our lives with your word in the name of Jesus. Father, we desire, Lord, creating us a desire to be in step, in tune with your spirit 24-7. Even while we sleep, we sleep in step with your spirit. Whether we work, whether we, 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 we do business, whatever we do, may we be in step with your presence, Lord. Because we desire to be in line with your word so that your spirit can work through us effectively and so that we can align ourselves with the work of the spirit constantly, Lord. Lord, we ask forgiveness for when we made the gifts of the Spirit and the move of the Spirit something that you never intended it to be. We repent of that. And we ask that you would continue to lead us in this truth. As you say, the helper would guide you in all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just give Jesus another round of applause. And we can stand for the song, amen. You're faithful to the ages. The God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak. A word it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the same, same I will praise. Seasons change, but you remain the same, Lord. Yeah, God, from age to age, till the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Yeah, your history can prove nothing you can do. You're faithful and true, though the storms may come and the winds may. Remain steadfast and let my heart learn if you speak a word you would come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Oh, oh, oh. Great is your faithfulness. Setting same, I will pray your. 
Come on, family. Look. To my hope and firm foundation, you never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus. I anchor to the ground. church. I think you can take your seats. Amen. Who believes God is faithful? We just sang it, hey? Who believes God can heal? He is a God of miracles. Amen. And who's seen God's faithfulness this year? Amen. Glory. And do you believe his word is true? Amen. Amen. So I think that um, if we believe this, without going into too much uh, detail, um, who believes God is in charge of their finances? Yes. Yes. Amen? <laughs> so I encourage you, please, to give. Mm. To give, and God said in his word that he will give you pressed down, shaking together, running over. And who's seen it? Can I see who's seen it? I've seen it. Amen. <laughs> so Amen. please, can we um, use the Zapper app? And um, please, also, you can do an EFT. Our details are on the website. And I'd encourage you to give. 
And we have a few um, announcements. I think Pastor Owen has a special announcement for the impact kit. Hallelujah. Am I on? Yes. So let me call my sister. Sister Jeannie, come stand here. Stand here. Sister Jeannie has been elected as part of the regional Sunday school committee. Let's put our hands together. (laughs) So we are going to do a prayer for her. Um, It's good that we uh, represent as well on our regional um, areas as as we as a church. We can learn so much from other churches, but we can also uh, have so much to give. Um, in terms of when it comes to our own region. And in, we, as a church, we believe also it's important to be involved in regional activities. Amen. You will see more of that coming um, as the year goes on and in the announcements. But let's just stretch our hand out to Sister Jeannie. And we are trusting God to anoint her, appoint her, and walk with her. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, this is your daughter. You've chosen her for such a time as this. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, that your conviction would be upon her. And that wherever she serves in those comedies, Lord, that your, that your conviction would be, would move, that your spirit would constantly move where she goes, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We pray for your anointing upon her. We pray, Lord, for wisdom, for insight. We pray for your presence to be with her in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for that you've called her to serve on regional level. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said... Amen. Let's put our hands together one more time. You can, uh, while she stands here also, who here loves Jesus? Just raise your hand. I want to see something quickly. Who? No one? Why, why are you guys so slow with that? You should have jumped out of your seats. So number two, who loves children? Okay. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, that's the only qualification we need. We need Sunday school teachers. That's why we haven't been able to open up in person because a lot of our teachers step down which is understandable but we need to new teachers to come to the front your only qualification and i'm not only talking about lady teachers men you can also be sunday school teachers all right so the so i want to encourage the men as well no matter how old you are be a sunday school teacher i want to encourage you don't just wait for the ladies to step in let's get involved in last night's meeting uh brother winston Uh, encourage the men to also get involved in areas of ministries we can't be a woman run church only i know your previous pastor was a woman (laughs) but we can't be a woman and just men i'm calling you to step up into into these ministries to step in into these ministries our kids needs male role models and the best place to have them is in the church all right so i want to encourage you step in step up let's let's get ourselves involved in the sunday school ministry and then talk to Jeannie. We soon will start um, calling you. If you're not, no one has heed our call, and we've been announcing this for more than a month now. It's it's not a good thing, guys. We need to step in and help step up. Whether COVID is here or not, we still need to disciple. We still need to carry out God's kingdom. Um, whether you go to the shop or whether you go to your workplace, it's still a risk of you getting infected. And so let's rather minimize the risk than coming to church because here we at least keep, we have control over the amount of people we allowed, the, the people we sanitize, temperature, we've got control over. Whether you go to a mall or restaurant, you've got no control. You have no say over how they manage the COVID risk there. So let's rather get involved as, as guys as well. I want to encourage you. Let's get involved in our Sunday school so that our young kids, that's the only thing we can leave them. We can leave them money and all these things that will go away. But the kingdom of God is here. And we can leave that to them. And that will stay with them even after their death. They will still benefit of that. So let's be men and let's step into our God-given role and be involved in Sunday school. So please um, talk to her about this if you want to get involved. And then we are opening our in-person services again on the 23rd of May. Um, And then virtual impact kids meeting online would be at 10.30. So please, you will have to register either on our website Or you could email Agnes at info at afmimpact.org and say you'd like to register your kids for Sunday service. And then you will, uh, she will send you a confirmation email that she saw it and that you are registered. All right. Are we there? Are we good? Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, so the other announcement that we have um, as we come out of Easter and celebrating the crucifixion, the resurrection, 
Now we have Pentecost, um, Pentecost time, so we have prayer meeting on the 24th, the 25th, and the 27th of May. That's from 6 p.m. and 8.30 p.m., and it will be in church. Um, so please, please attend. It's also as important as the feast of Ishtim and Resurrection. Please be involved with that. We have the worship night, so the Pentecost worship night uh -huh. on 28th May. Come on. 6 o'clock to 8.30 Somebody. <laughs> Somebody give Jesus some glory. <laughs> and then Pentecost service on 29th May. So that's mm -hmm. also 6 p.m. So everything starts at 6 p.m. and ends at 8.30. So please put that into your diaries and um, please be sure to be here. Then we also have Impact Bible Study, which we've started with, with Pastor Owen, every Wednesday. And this is online. But please, um, we'd encourage you to be present in church. So join us in church. It's interactive. It's a learning opportunity. And that's at 7 p.m. every Wednesday. And the theme is the Holy Spirit. It's in correlation with Pentecost. So attendance to be, the attendance will be done in person and streamed online. And then the 19th of May will be the motivation for spiritual gifts. And the 26th of May will be um, the ministry of spiritual gifts. So we have one more special announcement from the men's ministry. If the, the Pentecost presentation team is going to come up, the leader, please. Morning, everyone. Greetings to you all. I've got a special announcement uh, directed to men. We have got uh, a FM Gauteng North Region a seminar that will be happening on the 5th of June. We're encouraging all men from our church uh, to attend. The registration will be 50 rands. Uh, I encourage everyone to, 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 to start registering so that at least we, we can be able to manage the numbers. Uh, we know we are still in COVID. All the protocols will be observed. And we have got a, a, a special a guest speaker that will be coming as well, a, a, a medical doctor, physician. Uh, the, the, the seminar will be centered on men's health. So it's a very, very important uh, seminar. I'm not sure about the men in this house, if it's important to you, but I think this is very, very important seminar. Uh, I encourage all ladies who have got a man in their house to encourage the, the men to, to, to participate in this session. It will be very helpful. Thank you very much. in honor, we would like to ask Dr. Tux to please close in prayer since we have him here. We have to <laughs> we have to have that. Amen. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Papa. <laughs> we can all stand. Amen. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, you know the team goes through so much, the family. I just want us to also appreciate everyone let's say on the stage. They they put in so much effort, you know, coming every Thursday to practice after work and everything. So, you know, um, I'll pick up to everyone that's here, guys. It's an honor to worship with you. God bless you all. So we've got this beautiful song and also the team there on top there, the multimedia. They're like, oh, what about us? And Amelia there and, and everyone, the whole team. Thank you, guys. So um, we've got this beautiful song that I uh, would love to do. It's a new song. Um, I believe, you know, it's, it's going to do something in the house of the Lord this morning. That's why I was like, please pray after it, Papa, so then um, we can do it. Can we have it up on the screen? upon his name. His name is Jesus. Say, Jesus, the Lamb of God, Savior and King, you alone are worthy of our praise forever. You alone are seated on the 
family I want you to sing with us and sing hey you are the king that gave us life with every drop of your blood call upon the Savior now and say Jesus the Just worship the Lord. That's where we go. Lord, we came here this morning just to worship you. We understand, Lord, that this is why you've created us. Why you've brought us here this morning, Lord. We came to worship you in spirit and in truth, Jesus. That's all we know what to do. That's all we came to do, Jesus. Come on, somebody. Just come on, lift his name on us. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. I worship you. Come on, worship the Lord now. Say, I worship you. 
18 months away, 11 in Kenya and some in Zimbabwe. All those days, the Lord has been faithful to us. My prayer is going to be very short as I end at the church this morning. God gave me Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who sitteth not in the council of the ungodly, standeth not in the council of the scorners, but whose delight is in the word of God. He shall be like a tree planted by the riverside, who shall bear his fruit in season. I am praying for two things that God keeps you in your position in good health and that God fills you with the Holy Spirit so that you can excel in your gift in season. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm so grateful that you have given us life. You have given us your son, Jesus. And you have given us the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, for each and every person in this hall, from the pastor to every member, that you keep them in good health. Father, I pray that no weapon Hope that against them shall prosper, that they shall excel in their area of gifting and calling. Father, I pray in this time of Pentecost for the maximum filling of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with your power, God. Fill each one of us with your power, that they excel in their gift, that they, in their unique gifts, Father. I pray for their health. I pray for their excellence, spirit of excellence upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.